Thank you, Chairperson. And I would also like to thank Dr. Amitabha and the PCSI committee for this kind invitation. This is an angiogram of a child one year following repair of anomalous RPA from the aorta. He had an excellent outcome from balloon dilation alone. The original pathology and the fairly recent surgery must have been favorable for this uncommon outcome. However, in the vast majority of branch based stenosis, they require stenting. For my talk, I'll be covering these areas. First, imaging and equipment. Secondly, materials such as catheters, guide wires, shears, and balloon for a successful procedure. And thirdly, some special situations. CT angio is increasingly relied upon as it gives important perspective on the anatomy we are dealing with. In some complex lesions, it is valuable for decision making whether surgery is a safer option, such as here where the coronary artery might be at risk, or here where the pulmonary arteries are stretched and hug the aorta post lecompte. These are simpler lesions where perhaps echocardiography is sufficient, but it may help in pre-procedure planning, for example, selecting the right stent size and length. PA stenting is often a challenging procedure where good imaging and rapid changes in thoroscopy projections are important, hence having a biplane system really helps. These are the commoner projections, for example, the RAO for the RPA, aleocranial for the, and lateral for the LPA, and the deep caudal for bifurcation stenting. Rotational angiography may be helpful when we face difficulty in getting a wire across a tight stenosis in a distorted anatomy. Good angio images are important for detailed assessment of lesions and adjacent vessels and also helps in visualization of side branches in the vicinity of the lesion to be stented. The multi-track catheter from NUMED is valuable for this purpose. It is tracked over the wire in a monorail fashion and markers provide reference for measurements of length. We can also measure pressure gradients across lesions with the wire still remaining in place. However, if you don't have it available, a cut pigtail with side holes straddling the lesion also serve the same purpose, giving nice images of the lesion and the adjacent vessels. Cutting balloons are non-compliant balloons with four sharp steel blades and this is to create four controlled tears in second intima and media without over dilating the vessels. We use this mainly for lesions that are likely to be resistant, that is, these are densely fibrotic lesions before stent implantation, and these are often in vessels that have had previous surgical reconstruction or stenosis caused by constriction of ductal tissues. They require to be used with a long sheath so that this prevents trauma to structures like the tricuspid valve during withdrawal of this balloon. And they require a smaller sized wire, so we often use the stiff V18 wire for this purpose. This patient had previous extensive PA reconstruction at tough repair due to discontinuous and hyperplastic left pulmonary artery. This is the cutting balloon used for predilation and this is following predilation with cutting balloon and this is the final result following stent implantation. These are the commonly used stents, but maybe only a few of these are available in this region. What is important is that these stents, when implanted in small children, they should be redilatable to adult size vessels. Uh, which is about 18 to 20 millimeters. And the examples here are in red. For example, the formula stent, the Valeo, and the Genesis. And this in brackets are the final dilatation capabilities of this stent. I'm only familiar with the Genesis XD. And previously, I had used 
formula until be, it they became unavailable. For the Palmas genesis, we must ensure that it is the genesis XD, which denotes extra diameter that is dilatable to 18 millimeters in dimension, and they don't come pre-mounted. I'm not sure if this genesis, which is pre-mounted on Opta Pro, is dilatable to that kind of diameter. How about the balloons to mount the stands on? In general, the medium to high pressure balloons like the Zimet and the Malins, which can go up to 15 atmospheres, are sufficient even for the most resistant lesions. The ultra high pressure balloons are mainly for breaking stent struts and they are only occasionally required for very, very resistant lesions. I would like to share some case examples to illustrate further the preceding points. And the first is a two and a half year old boy with fellow tetralogy pulmonary atresia. He had PD stenting as initial palliation, and this is one and a half years after conduit repair, showing severe LPA stenosis and a small LPA caliber. With the help of rotational angiogram, we choose a most suitable angulation to wire across that lesion and this is pre-dilation with a 6 millimeter cutting balloon. And we did an angiogram with a multi-track catheter to illustrate further the details of the lesion following pre-dilation. We further pre-dilated with an 8 millimeter balloon before implanting a formula stent over a 10 millimeter balloon. The LEO projection tends to foreshorten the area of interest and it is valuable using the lateral projection for correct positioning of this stent. And this is the final results. The second case is the patient that was referred to us at the age of eight. He has phallus tetralogy, which was repaired earlier. And at surgery, the surgeon could not find the left pulmonary artery and this is the preliminary angiogram showing an occluded left pulmonary artery. Attempt at recanalization with the coronary wire was unsuccessful. This was the furthest that the wire could go. Perhaps this is the hilum. And uh, following a transeptal puncture, a pulmonary vein wedge angiogram opacified the left pulmonary arteries, which are very small. And this is the lateral view of that. We finally managed to recanalize the occluded LPA with an RF wire, which we then exchanged that with a small coronary wire. Initial dilation was using a 3 millimeter coronary balloon, and this is angiogram following pre-dilation with a cutting balloon, and this is the final result of LPA stenting. We repeated angiogram at six months post, and we additionally implanted a second stent beyond the first one because of this mild stenosis and this is three years after the initial procedure showing that the LPA that was initially occluded and extremely small now has been reasonably well rehabilitated through all these various procedures. Bifurcation stenosis is very challenging. It requires simultaneous deployment to prevent crushing of stents and it is best done by having two experienced operators. What is important is to have a sheath and a stand position in each PA branch, and this is repeatedly uh, checked before final inflation. And it is also important to note that there will be a drop in cardiac output and blood pressure during inflation. Some have advocated the wide stand technique for bifurcation stenosis instead of simultaneous deployment. A first stent is implanted in one vessel, then an ultra high pressure balloon is used to break the struts so that a second stent can be implanted into the other pulmonary artery, and this is how it is supposed to look like. I myself have no experience with this kind of technique. These are some of the more common pitfalls of PA stenting. They include slippage of stent from the a balloon, malpositioning, dislodgement and migration of stents, and the causes are often 
uh, some optimal crimping of the stent on the balloon, an undersized balloon being used, balloon rupture, and kinking of the long sheath. They can lead to the more serious complications such as dissection and rupture of vessels. This is an example of slippage. The stent had been crimped onto the balloon, which is too long, and I didn't have a shorter balloon at that point, and I thought it would be better to place it distally because the vessel in front of it is small. But see what happens. As I inflated the balloon, it pushed the stent forward, and we had then needed to put back the balloon onto the stent, inflate it partially, and brought it back to the right position, and this is the final outcome. This is a stent that had migrated and settled into a distal LPA branch nicely. It is a large stent and there seems to be no obstruction to flow and we then simply implanted a second stent. And some years later, this stent has fractured and this is before placement of another stent to take care of that fractured stent. Special situations. In post-arterial switch, the primary arteries may stretch and wrap around the aorta, and it is quite controversial whether this should be dealt with surgically or by stent implantation. It has been reported that uh, stent implantation may lead to aortopulmonary fistulas due to erosion of fractures of the stent. While this seems okay for stenting, these other two patients, we felt that they are best dealt with by the surgeons, and this illustrates the importance of CT NGU as part of the decision making. A more serious issue in post arterial switch is the possibility that the coronary artery may lie fairly close to a stenosed branch pulmonary artery. This patient has trifurcation stenosis, which looks very complex, and the RCA especially is lying close to that LPA proximally. And this is the angiogram prior and during balloon interrogation. Maybe not big enough balloon and the reduction in flow may, may not be very obvious, but this patient developed transient pulmonary edema and he was then referred for surgical repair of this complex stenosis of the pulmonary arteries. This is an interesting paper from Huayda El Said in San Diego that looked at the risk of PA stenting specific to patients following post arterial switch. Finally, just a few words on hybrid method of PA stenting by way of a case example. And this is a six-year-old boy with tough pulmonary atresia, had conduit repair and was stuck in the ICU because of low cardiac output syndrome due to severe LPA stenosis. He couldn't tolerate percutaneous stenting. I presume that uh, the sick right ventricle just could not tolerate a stiff guide wire and stiff catheter with a long sheath and dilator to be negotiated into the pulmonary artery and the procedure was abandoned. The following day, the patient was brought to the hybrid lab and the surgeon helped us insert a short sheath at the RVOT, which gave a direct access to the left pulmonary artery and the LPA stent was managed to be implanted without much complication. PA stenting is one of the more challenging interventions in pediatrics. And for that reason, there is an increasing reliance on CT imaging as part of the decision-making process and pre-procedure planning. It's nice to have biplate angiography, and sometimes rotational angiography may be helpful in some of the more difficult cases. It is important to have a selection of catheters, as well as other materials such as multi-track catheter and cutting balloons for some of these more resistant lesions. The pitfalls that are commonly seen with this procedure are slippage of stent from the balloon and occasionally migration, and this may relate to suboptimal crimping as well as positioning of the stents. 
in post arterial switch, the risk of coronary compression is important and that makes the role of CT really relevant for this group of patients. And finally, the hybrid procedure is important when we are dealing with sick children with poor right ventricle following cardiac surgery. Thank you for your attention.